reminder that we will be continuing through the summer. So every uh, other Monday, we will be meeting at this time and at this link. So yeah, so just to um, introduce Vikrant, he's currently at uh, Yale University at the Department of Biomedical Engineering, where he works uh, with Professor Mike Murrell. Uh, he has a background in both soft matter and biological physics experiments. So he got, uh, Vikrant got his PhD from uh, Clark University where he was working on the granular mechanics of rod-like particles with Professor Arshad Kibruli. And then he worked at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in the group of Professor Jenny Ross where he trained in in vitro cytoskeletal uh, protein experiments. And currently he's working on <clears throat> cells and tissues and we, will, we are excited to hear more about how cells and tissues can also have an equation of state and how and thermodynamic properties like surface tension. So Vikrant, if you could share your screen. Yeah, thank you. Start. Yeah, so take it away when you're ready. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Kinjal. Thank you, Suraj, for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for this uh, opportunity. I, I have been following these talks for uh, like several years now, and uh, and uh, I'm really happy that I get to speak today. So, so as uh, I was introduced, my name is Vikrant. I'm an associate research scientist at Department of Biomedical Engineering uh, at Yale. and um, I work in group of Professor Mike Morell, and uh, today I'm going to tell you about some of the recent work that we have been doing, uh, which pertains to equations, equation of state for a tissue. Um, I'll admit a few people. So, okay. Um, so, so this has been like a long work in the making. Uh, uh, it's a series of papers that we are working on, uh, two of which are out, and uh, a few of them are currently in review. And uh, so, and because it's such a big work, it, in, it required like a lot of people um, to work together. And a uh, couple of people who were working on it was, uh, uh, most of the experimental work was done by Dr. Suleiman Yusufzai, who has now moved on to NIH. And uh, Pasha and me were mostly uh, doing some of the experiments, but we are more on the quantitative side. Uh, Sorosh is our in-house mechanical engineer who does all these multi-physics simulations for us. Uh, Serene was a visiting graduate student uh, who did some very good work with measurement uh, with like nuclei in these uh, tissues. And, uh, and Mike Morel is the, is the big boss who brings us all the money and uh, toys that we play with. And, uh, and over years, we have been very grateful for support from NIH, uh, Army Research Office, and HFSP for funding this work. So, so I'll jump straight away into the, the big question that we ask in the lab. Uh, there is something in the chat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying that, Kinjal. Yeah, please stop me whenever you want. Uh, you can unmute yourself, ask a question, uh, or put, post it in the chat. Um, Okay, so, so the biggest question that we ask in the lab is that uh, what are the guiding principles behind biological assembly and design? So for example, um, here is an example of uh, 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 a bud growing out of a soil. Um, this is an example of uh, morphogenesis in, a, in an embryo where you see that a tadpole evolves uh, from uh, like a larva-like structure and it uh, as the cell grows and divides, it develops the, all these modular limbs with different functionalities. Here is an example of a wound healing assay where you see uh, a monolayer of cells and uh, somewhere in the center, you shoot it with a James Bond quality laser and uh, you see a wound is created. And then all these cells kind of like come together and try to heal this wound. And, uh, and the reverse problem of this is that when you see a tumor or a cell aggregate, which is landing on a substrate and then trying to spread out. And, uh, and the questions that we would like to ask is that, are there general guiding principles uh, which can explain all these phenomena or maybe certain class of these phenomena? Uh, because uh, 
at the background, like in all these systems, what is happening is that there are cells which are trying to move around, divide, grow, and uh, and do achieve some kind of functionality. And and then the next question is, what do we mean by these guiding principles in general? So so to be ambitious, we mean something along the lines of guiding principles in physics. So say things like minimization of energy. Uh, a droplet of water is round for the same reason the whole planet is round. Uh, it's trying to minimize its energy. Um, things, ideas like conservation of energy and momentum. So say here is for an example, you start with uh, uh, an ideal gas in a box. These particles are moving around and by balancing energy and momentum, you can come up with an equation of state. Ideas like maximization of entropy. So, which is, so here, for example, you see a liquid crystal and uh, the idea of maximization of entropy is the bread and butter for uh, all of my friends who do liquid crystal research. And finally, ideas like uh, force and mass balance, things that allow you to solve these uh, random high school problems where you see monkeys hanging from police for no reason. And, and the reason we like these guiding principles is because they allow you to be predictive. And that is what you want in physics. Uh, so for example, uh, with the ideal gas, like uh, uh, guiding principles allow you to define state variables like pressure, volume, and temperature. And then it allows you to combine these things together to give something like an equation of state. And that, that equation of state allows you to specify the uh, state of the system. It allows you how the system evolves. It uh, tells you how it will behave when you perturb it. And, but there, there is a small catch when these things work. And that is, when things are in equilibrium. And the bets are off when you're kind of out of equilibrium. And uh, it could be any kind of equilibrium, but you need to be either in some kind of equilibrium or close to it. So you should either be in mechanical equilibrium or in thermal equilibrium or in phase equilibrium. And it's based on the general ideas which were initially proposed by people like uh, Boltzmann and Gibbs and Amin Euther and later evolved into non-equilibrium uh, physics. And the thing is that these ideas are like so important that recent years, like as soon as you find something uh, which is applicable to a system out of equilibrium, they give you a Nobel Prize for it. So, so all the undergraduates and first year graduate students uh, who are in physics to win a Nobel Prize, uh, take some notes. Okay, and, and that is where our problem with biology begins because biology is inherently out of equilibrium. So for example, if you look at mechanical equilibrium, uh, the reason you could solve this problem of a monkey hanging on a pulley is because it's under some kind of a global mechanical equilibrium. That's why you can add up tensions, balance it with accelerations and get some solution. Now compare this to something like this, like a cell monolayer, which is trying to grow uh, and the cells are dividing and as it grows, as it moves. Now in this problem at best, Mechanical equilibrium is satisfied only locally because the cells are interacting with each other at a local level. And that's why it becomes really difficult to define some kind of like a global equilibrium behavior. Things get more complicated when you're looking at things like thermal equilibrium. So for example, here is a monkey which is out of equilibrium. It can eat food, hang around, do all kinds of things. Uh, a monkey in thermal equilibrium would be a dead monkey because then it's just taking thermal energy from its environment and releasing it back. And the second problem with biology outside of equilibrium is that biology is complex. For example, if you talk to a biologist, they would show you this picture of a cell and they will tell you that cell is the simplest unit of life. Now, look at this picture. I am trained as a physicist. I think planet is a point particle of mass M. With this level of complexity, I cannot even start to make sense out of things. And, and that is what brings us to the way we try to treat problems in our lab, which is the ideas from reconstituted biology. So think of it as that uh, we start with a cell. Um, uh, think of it as that we start with a cell. Uh, there are a lot of things inside it which are con constantly interacting with each other. We cut it open, throw everything out, keep three or four things to make a reconstituted system. And, and that is what allows us to do simplified biology. And, and that is what we think is important because we think that these simplified systems 
are the place where the general principles of biology are hiding. We are not planning to look at something which is complex at the level of a cell, tissue, or an organ, but these simplified systems. So in this case, some look, instead of looking at uh, a full cell uh, where uh, you have thousands, if not tens of thousands components which are constantly interacting with each other, if you want to study cytoskeleton of this, instead of looking at this full cell, we will simply look at the reconstituted cytoskeleton. Similarly, if you want to understand what a tumor behaves like, instead of looking at a tumor which is growing in vivo and can uh, draw some kind of blood supply and oxygen supply, we are going to look at something very simple, which is just a collection of cells or a cellular spheroid. And, uh, and it's not just these particular examples. We do it across uh, all scale of things. So for examples, we recently published uh, some work where we looked at how the binding kinetics of motor proteins affect the mechanics of the networks. Uh, we look at uh, these reorganization of cytoskeleton networks uh, using uh, molecular motor proteins in these reconstituted networks. Uh, you can put uh, these uh, ectomyosin networks inside a lipid vesicle to model something which is uh, similar to a reconstituted cell or a simplified cell. Or you can go all across the scale to the biggest length scale that they're interested in, put some of the cells together and try to see what the behavior of this emergent tissue is like. And that's when we are interested in problems like wound healing and simple tissues. And uh, so for today's talk, I would like to focus on this particular work on the other, on the largest length scale that we work on, which is the physics of simple tissues. What we want to do is that we want to understand the mechanical properties of these tissues because we want to understand them in the language of continuum mechanics. And what we want to do is that we want to uh, put these mechanical properties together and see if we can say something deeper about the thermodynamics of the tissue. And this is again all motivated by our the big grand high overarching goal is that are the general like guiding principles which uh, determine the growth and mechanics of these tissues. The simple questions that you want to ask that are there any issue uh, principles like that? Um, if they are, can they be modulated into or like written into the terms of some kind of an equation of state? And finally, even if we can find one, is it sufficiently general? so that it can be applied to a larger class of systems. So the works that I'm going to talk about are two of our papers that recently came out. Uh, one is uh, this work that came out in January in PRL, Active Regulation of Pressure and Volume Defines an Energetic Constraint on Growth of Cell Case. And this paper that came out in March in Physical Review Fluids, which says gradients in solid surface tension drive Marangoni-like motion. Uh, so these are just fancy terms, but essentially what we are trying to do is that we are going to estimate what is the energetic cost of making a tissue and how it uh, guides the dynamics of the system. And we are going to do that by drawing analogies between a tissue and a drop of liquid. So, but before I do, I'll have to give you like a brief introduction to tissues, like a, a physicist's version. And so like any, Respect, uh, like uh, any biophysicist who trained in physics and is just moving into biophysics. Uh, I started my research from Wikipedia um, to learn what tissues are. And, and this is what our general idea of a tissue is when we think of it. We think of tissues as collection of cells, uh, maybe of the same kind, maybe of different kinds, which are kind of get together from, uh, they form a hierarchical system. Uh, so that uh, they can achieve some kind of functionality. They can belong to different parts of the body. So for example, you can have like epithelial tissues in skin or you can have uh, muscle tissues, uh, which allows you to do all kinds of motion. But when I look at all of this detail, it's, it's too much complexity for me. Uh, as a physicist, I want to remove all these details so we look at what is the simplest possible system. And I think it is this part. A tissue is an ensemble of similar cells. And that is the level of simplicity that we want to work with. We are, not, we are going to remove every detail out of this tissue and we're going to create a tissue which is made of similar kind of cells. 
Now, now this is the general model how, how biologists work with tissues and tumor. They would have tumor cells, implant them into a mouse. Over a few weeks to a month, the mouse would grow, the tumor would grow, they will kill the mouse or they take it out. Uh, that is already death metal to me. I cannot do this. So, so I will do the next best thing. I will I'll grow my own tissues. And, uh, and that might sound like a lot of work, but uh, it's essentially not. It's, it's super easy, barely an inconvenience. So, so this is how a physicist would make a tissue. You take some cells, put them into a petri dish, let them grow for like two days. When you have sufficient number of them, take them out, put them into a beaker, uh, use the beaker which is non-sticky so that cells do not stick to the surface and put it in a shaker where it gyrates for like two days uh, at a given notation. Two days later, you go back and voila, the, centri uh, the centripetal forces have taken into action. Everything has clumped together, made these aggregates. Uh, Joseph says tissues are not just cell. You ignore all the excess cellular stuff. Uh, yes, Joseph. Uh, so. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, big fan of your work. Um, so, but uh, yeah. So for this particular thing uh, example that I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to look at this oversimplified version of tissues when where there is no extracellular matrix, where uh, um, there is uh, uh, nothing else. It's just a, it's a cell aggregate, which is a freely suspended ball of tissues, a ball of cells. Uh, we would, uh, later, I will tell you that uh, some of the results that we see uh, in these oversimplified system also hold for more complex systems, uh, but I'll come to it. So, but yeah, thank you for asking. So yeah, so as Joseph pointed out, these are super simplified or what we call it like the spherical cow version of uh, the tissue mechanics. So um, yeah, so once we uh, gyrate these things over a period of two days, uh, you see that all these cells come together and make these balls of uh, cells, which is what we are going to call our model tissue. And uh, uh, you can look at them in light, you can uh, uh, transfect them with some kind of protein, so you can look at internal structure. For example, here we are looking at uh, the actin in these uh, cells. And, uh, and uh, what we think is that uh, though this is an oversimplified system, uh, this is the level of complexity that might allow you to say something uh, either physical or at a level where you can talk about like even thermodynamics of these things. Uh, we think that uh, though it is oversimplified, it could still uh, represent as a model of a very early stage tumor. Um, uh, Avinayam Singh is asking, are you thinking about tissues as deformable particles? Uh, so, Yes, Abhin. So I would say, Abhin, that we are thinking of them uh, as uh, uh, so. So we are, we, are, we are thinking of them as uh, some kind of viscoelastic material. I would show that at very short time scale, they behave as like elastic solids. At long time scales, they behave like a fluid, and and that's why we would be able to define quantities like uh, modulus or or surface tension of these tissues. Uh, those of you who do not know Abhinendra, he is the rising star in field of rheology. Uh, go check out his work, uh, really top quality stuff. So yeah, uh, so I'll get to uh, uh, this idea. So what computer? Okay, so we think this could be an, a model example for a tumor. We think it could uh, be a model example for an embryo before uh, it, uh, like before the division starts to like divide these cells into different kinds of cell types. So an early stage embryo. And this is, we, again, we think that this is a good example for a spherical organoid, which could be used for medicinal research. So, so we are not the first people who are looking and trying to say that uh, we should think of cell aggregates as liquid droplets. Uh, there was a lot of good stuff, um, like Joseph Kass, uh, like who was talking earlier, he has this beautiful paper on fusion of aggregates that recently came out. And Hasi and you gave a good talk about it. But some of these stuff, kind of stuff that we're interested in uh, is that say, for example, uh, Duzan and Brochard group look at spreading of cell aggregates. Uh, when you have these aggregates, they are looking and spreading out and they compare them to a liquid droplet. Uh, there was this very good body of literature that came out from the group of like Dolega, where they looked at how the stresses inside these uh, um, 
um, aggregates like scale as a function of their size and the location from the center. And uh, so what we did is that these were the lines along which we were thinking. And so when we made our aggregates and we were looking at it, the first thing that we noticed, which uh, uh, was also reported by Dolega, is that uh, when you look at the structure of these aggregates, everyone has compared them to a liquid droplet. But they are, the uh, organization of material inside these aggregates is, is different from a droplet. So for example, uh, this is an aggregate that we are looking at. And here we have labeled the actin. So you can actually look at the surface of the cells. And you can see that inside these cells are kind of like quite rounded up. Versus if you look at the cells which are on the edges, you see that they are kind of elongated. Now this becomes more prominent if you look at things, uh, if you look at the nuclei. So this was an experiment done by Serene where she labeled the nuclei. And you can see that in the center, all these nuclei are kind of well rounded up. But on the edges, they are all kind of stretched. Like, look at this one. This one is like hang, stretching out for its life. And this is different from our organization of molecules in a liquid droplet, where whether you are a molecule on the surface or on the uh, in, in the bulk, you are kind of the same. It's, the forces are not large enough to deform. So, so this is uh, where we got this idea that, okay, there might be some kind of like surface phenomena. Uh, and uh, to quantify it, we did a very basic uh, measurement where we defined an order parameter. So, so Grant, I'm can not I sure ask if... a question about yes, these? Yes. Uh, yeah, the, these cells that you and other groups have done, where they become these droplet-like aggregates, is how is it cell type dependent? I mean, do you have to use cells that are that tend to form tumors, for example, and are more sticky to each other? So. So, so in this particular example uh, that uh, I'm showing, uh, these are the cells which are kind of like sticky, but this phenomenon does not depend upon, uh, uh, for a freely suspended aggregate, like it does not have to be like dependent upon like stickiness. So uh, we have experimented with glioblastoma cells, uh, which are like usual brain tumor cells. Uh, we have looked at MDCK cells and all these different kinds of cell lines, they still tend to form these aggregates and uh, which preserves this general structure where things are kind of like rounded in the center and stretched at the uh, edges. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so we tried to define this very simple order parameter and uh, uh, by just looking at the cross product of the orientation and the alignment of the cells and nuclei. So, so, so if there are any undergrads, uh, in the top, I'm not sure if they are, but the general idea is that uh, we are looking at an aggregate going to a particular location, which is this vector Ri. And at that location, we are looking what is the orientation or the alignment of uh, a nuclei or, uh, or, the, or the cell itself. Uh, if we take a, dot, a cross product of these things, the general idea is that uh, if these things are randomly aligned and you take an average over a large number of these, you should get something close to zero. But if you're close to edges where these things are more orthoradially aligned, you should get a larger contribution. The question, I think, aggressive tumor cells do not form spheroids and epithelial cells are stabilized by collective actin ring. Okay, okay, yeah, thank you, Joseph. So, yeah, so I, I did not know about aggressive tumor cells. So, uh, thank you. So, okay, so uh, to add to what uh, Kinjal asked earlier, um, so for, 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 36, uh, for 36 cells as cancer cells form tumor spheroids, 231s don't assemble, they stay they basically stay single, while a healthy breast tissue is even stabilized not only by the cells, they basically are con uh, have a contractile ring surrounding it. So there are big differences in different cell types. Oh, okay, thank you, uh, thank you. So. Yeah, uh, that's a good piece of it. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah, I did not know that. So, so, okay. So, so back to uh, the kind of like cell types that I was talking about. So, uh, so, so yeah. So in these aggregates, when we are looking at uh, these uh, orientation fields, uh, we notice that uh, as expected, like when you are close to the center, these alignment parameters are small. Versus as you move away from the center of the aggregate and move towards the edges, you see that this alignment parameter goes up. And uh, 
it's it's not just for one aggregate. If you look through aggregates of different sizes and average these values, uh, you find that uh, for aggregates uh, of different sizes, there is a size dependent in alignment. So smaller aggregates tend to be more aligned at the edges compared to the bigger ones. And, and a lot of this is activity dependent. So we have this uh, molecule called blebistatin, which is my second favorite molecule of all times. And uh, what it does is that if you add it to uh, like a cellular system, it, to, it stops all the molecular motors myosin from working. Um, inside jammed and outside unjammed. Uh, uh, Joseph, would you like to expand on that? Inside jammed and outside unjammed? So basically, if you believe in shape-induced uh, cell jamming and unjamming, then the cells on the inside would be basically solid and would be jammed and couldn't move, while the outside cells are elongated and fluid. I see, I see. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I, I remember like from... Uh, like like your recent work on like alveoli, where you see like a lot of these like reorganization and yeah yeah that would make sense. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so you basically would have two spheres: a solid inner sphere, a fluid outer uh, shell. Yeah. So 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 there is uh, yeah to to that. So we haven't reported it in this paper, but we actually have measured the stiffness of these aggregates, and we know that uh, there is some uh, that that quantity also depends upon the size. So the inner smaller sphere tend to be like stiffer compared to the outer edges. And, uh, and, and we think like that could be one of the mechanism by which these cells are, uh, um, have the size dependent surface tension because that leads to how, how much they spread or which means how much stresses these cells are under and how much motor protein that they accumulate. So, but we will come to that as well. So, so yeah, so the general idea is that we see these kind of alignments which scale with the size of things. And uh, yeah, so, so the question that we wanted to ask next is that what is the effect of these mechanical properties on the structure of these tissues? So, so we simply went and measured these, uh, uh, the surface tension of these aggregates. Uh, there is this beautiful work by Gord Yan that came out in 2010, where they use a micropipette um, and uh, the general idea is that uh, you have this uh, very fine glass pipette, which is passivated. You create a pressure difference, bring it close to an aggregate, and it pulls this aggregate in. At some point, you turn off the pressure, and it allows the material to flow back. And uh, by looking at the rates at which this material moves in versus moves out, uh, you can calculate uh, by using uh, a four-element mix model, you can calculate the material properties and uh, um, uh, material properties and surface tension of these uh, aggregates. And so when we did that, we found this behavior. So we are looking at the surface tension of aggregate, and we find that the surface tension of this cell aggregate depends upon its size. Now, take a moment to like think about it. Like for the first time, when you read about surface tension when you're in high school, uh, you study that surface tension is an intrinsic quantity. And that means that uh, it does not depend upon the size or the amount of material of the fluid for which you're measuring it. You can have a drop of water, a glass of water, a whole planet made of water, it would still have the same surface tension. And here we are saying that with these simple tissues or like cell aggregates, we are looking at a surface tension that depends upon the amount of material inside it. Hi, hi excuse me, could you give, give more details about how, how did you measure the surface tension? So you apply a pressure, then you wait until the system uh, get equilibrium. Yeah. So so we we start. Uh, so so this is a very well uh, defined technique, uh, which was uh, done by Gurkia. And uh, so you start with a micropipette. Uh, you connect it to like a like a water bath, which you can move up and down. So by that you can change the pressure. And uh, and when you create a negative pressure uh, close to an aggregate, the aggregate gets pulled in. And uh, by measuring the amount of, like the length of the material that has moved in, uh, you can get some kind of length as a time response kind of a thing. At some point you turn off that pressure and let the uh, material recede back. And uh, what you can do is that from there, you can look at the behavior of this thing, like the response of the applied pressure in a function of time. 
and uh, and then by using like a mixed element model you can calculate like the elastic and viscous responses and by balancing the pressure uh, at the interface you can calculate an effective surface tension and uh, I, I would direct you to this paper like a uh, very well written paper so um, there are other methods to do this by using uh, like a parallel plate compression which was uh, i think done by 40 um, and so so that is also a good source so Joseph says, uh, does not behavior change with longer time scales? So, so, so this is, so the longest time scale that we actually looked at was of the order of uh, an hour or so. Um, so we, uh, so uh, what, what is the time scale that you're thinking of, Joseph? Like um, days, hours, minutes? Basically time, time, scale, time scales where cells can start to migrate and proliferate. For example, if we talk about 16 hours or whatever, proliferation will fluidize the system and will basically naturally lower surface tension. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so there is no proliferation here. Uh, there is no cell growth. Uh, these cells have a cell like lifetime of about like uh, 24 hours. Like that's when they double. And uh, so we are looking at a much shorter time scale. So we think that during the process of over the, which these measurements were made. Uh, the, the surface tension of these aggregates are uh, uh, are fixed. Um, I'm, I'm going to show that these uh, are size dependent, uh, which will actually agree with the, this idea that as this aggregate gets bigger, which means which could happen by adding more cells to it, the surface tension will go down. Uh, yeah, just to make sure. So you mean the surface tension is the instantaneous surface tension, because the, the R naught is changing with time, so. So the surface tension is also changing with time. Uh, am I correct? Just... So, so for uh, this tissue, yeah, we're, we're talking about like surface tension over time scales, which are much smaller than the cell division time scales. So I saw the R the, the R naught is the instantaneous radius of the tissue, which is changing with time uh, from the movie you showed. Uh, if I if I understand correctly, like. A, so the R naught that is that I mean you mean the R naught that is almost constant during the experiment. So it's it, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh okay, R naught, yes. Sorry, yeah, I, I didn't catch it. Sorry, yeah. So yeah, so one of the assumptions that goes in this model is that uh, that R naught is constant. Uh if you look at our PRL paper, we have uh, uh this like uh, a correction term in the supplement where we actually show that even if R naught is uh, slightly variable, like how it would change. But then the general idea is that that the rate of change of R with time is small. So so yeah, R naught is kind of like fixed here. Um, Greg Huber asks, have you considered a prediction for the red curve here that should be independent of the radius, which it seems to be roughly red curve. The next slide, I think. Oh, this one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, so the, the red curve here, the prediction that we have is for this control term. The red curve is blebistatin. So the thing is that what we, uh, it's our control. Uh, the reason we think that this is being driven by motor activity is because when we suppress the motor activity by adding blebistatin, we see that this thing starts behaving like a regular fluid. It has a surface tension, which is constant over the size of these aggregates. And uh, so, so, so the, we believe that uh, this size-dependent surface tension has something to do with motor activity. So, so at this point, I would tell you a statement that you might have never heard before in your life, which is that we got a very good second reviewer. Uh, it was really like that person. Uh, if you're out there, thank you very much. Uh, they were really nice and kind. And uh, so they asked this very interesting question: that uh, what happens uh, there that could this measurement that you have a size dependent surface tension uh, is dependent, uh, you are seeing this because of your fixed size of your probe. Is it because of the fact that aggregate size is changing and the size of the micropipette is fixed? And so we decided to measure surface tension using a probe independent technique. We decided that we are going to do something similar to a wound healing assay. We'll make this tissue. Uh, we will shoot it with uh, this high intensity laser. And, and that should perturb the surface tension locally and see what the behavior of this motion is like. The idea was that we will look at these flow. Uh, it could be 
uh, from that, we can back calculate what the changes in surface tension are like. But this project, project kind of like evolved to have a life of its own because we started seeing some kind of like Marangoni flows. And so for those of you uh, uh, who do not know, just a very quick one second introduction of Marangoni flows is that these are the flows which are created by when there is a surface tension gradient. Uh, that could be created by changes in chemical concentration or by evaporation. And uh, so for in this particular example, uh, you have food color on milk. And when you add a Q-tip, which is dipped with soap, uh, the surface tension decreases locally. And you start seeing these beautiful outward looking flows. Uh, this is again the phenomena that explains the uh, these uh, tier of uh, wine phenomena or the coffee ring effect, where the surface tension gradient is created due to evaporation. And, and one of the hallmark of these Marangoni-like flows is this toroidal structure in 3D. So if you create a surface tension gradient, uh, the idea is that the flow starts to happen from uh, the region of low surface tension to regions of high surface tension. But because continuity needs to be preserved, you start get these like large toroidal flow. And uh, these were solved in like fully in 3D by Schmidt and Stark in 2016. So, so, so when we did our experiments, we were hoping to see some kind of Marangoni flow, but we got something more than that. So, so if you look at this tissue, this star is where we shot the lasers to create a defect. So you see, as expected, uh, there is a small flow which uh, starts moves away from the point of uh, ablation, which means the surface tension here is locally decreased. But then what you also see is that over time, this flow kind of like automatically reverses itself. And uh, after it decays, it comes back. Whereas when you look at aggregates, which were ablated the same way, uh, uh, but the motor activity was suppressed, you do not see anything. So, um, instead of like finding just one kind of Marangoni flow that we found or we were uh, expecting, we found a Marangoni flow which is uh, um, reversible and, and has not been observed before. Uh, we say that it is reversible because if at any point of this flow, if we take an integral of the net material transport, we find that the, all the material that goes in kind of comes back uh, leading, showing us that this uh, behavior or this flow is completely elastic. But so, so that's how this paper took a life of its own and became like the PR, the physical review fluids paper. But for, for this particular talk, I'm interested only in this very first part, where when I ablate it and I see this large uh, flow, which is created due to uh, ablation. And, and so, sorry, uh, Richard Gordon has his hand up for a while. So oh yeah, sorry. <clears throat> maybe he can just ask the question. Sure, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sure. yes I can. I can. Okay, uh, yeah, I worked a bit with Malcolm Steinberg, which who championed the differential adhesion hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, all of that work was done with two combinations of two cells making an onion type, what they called an onion structure. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions. One is at the boundary between the two tissues inside an onion structure are the cells aligned. Okay. And secondly, since you are finding the, uh, it, the uh, uh, surface tension is size dependent, you would expect that this would mess up the relationships between uh, the uh, uh, surface tensions that Steinberg found uh, versus size. So, yeah, so, so two things. So, so what we did is that uh, in sense of like surface tension with uh, respect to the size thing. Um, so we have measured the total number of cells uh, that we ablate. And, uh, and, and that is actually very small compared to the total number of cells in these aggregates. So we are looking at, uh, 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 we are talking about like several thousand, like 8,000 cells in the aggregate and out of which we should kill like five of them. And uh, so, so we don't think that there is a that there's a large change in surface tension because of the ablation, and uh, the for, for for the first part uh, where you ask like because of that onion structure, so so these are just like cells of single kind. Uh, we would like to think of them as they have a stiff core versus like a more fluid-like membrane at the top, uh, but. Uh, 
but uh, like when you look at like the flow here, you see that the motion that is happening is actually happening. It spans the size of the system. So when you ablate it, everything flows. And, uh, and that's why we think that uh, uh, this is like the very short time scale. So for example, you can see that all this phenomenon is happening at the time scale of like seconds. So we are thinking that in this time scale, the aggregates are actually responding elastically. Uh, the okay. interesting thing is- well, well, grant granted that Steinberg's time scales were a couple of days rather than seconds. That is yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, so you might be right on that point. Uh, however, he had a very strict rule. If, if you made an unrin structure, if you had three cell types, A, B, and C, if A yes. covered B and B covered C, then A would cover C. What I'm suggesting is that you are contradicting those rules. Hmm. That's okay. He, he could have been wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I don't have that hard to call Steinberg wrong. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I've, like maybe after the talk, if you could like direct me to some of those work. I, I have read some of his work, but I do not remember in particular the one that you're talking okay, about. Okay, but that, that so, was one of Richard, the Richard. In, uh, yeah. Richard, we have we have a new journal of physics out, uh, public second all, which where basically we exactly contradict his work already because already cell jamming and unjamming uh, basically breaks with the rules. So uh, so the beautiful work in in fluid tissues it doesn't work in in jam tissues. So in that oh, sense, oh. yeah, of course he did not consider those. <laughs> yeah, so. Just sorry for interfering, but just trying to help. So you're saying the so differential you, adhesion hypothesis does not work in jam tissues? It also it it work. The interesting thing is it it seems there seems to be also surface tension in jam tissues. Lisa Manning knows a lot about that and does work on it. But naturally, it's it's not our classical uh, uh, surface tension where you can move freely. So it's more contract it's more contractile things like also uh Vikrant's stuff uh, on the Blevistatin shows. Okay. So, well perhaps you will resolve the conflict between him and Mascona. <laughs> Mascona did the same experiments and came with came out with different results or di different conclusions. <laughs> I forgot the contradiction. That's why it's been a long, long time. It's about 70 years ago. <laughs> All right, this sounds like we, we, we have some time at the end for discussion and comments. Yeah, so this yeah. looks like a great topic okay. for that. Meanwhile, there were some <clears throat> questions on the chat about the laser ablation, like Greg Huber asks, <clears throat> can you describe the laser ablation in more detail? And Amaresh Sahu asks, uh, are there any cellular rearrangements to the relative to the original configuration at, at long times after you do the laser ablation? Yeah, so for Greg, uh... I mean, uh, I, I don't know what you mean by detail, but it's it's a very simple, straightforward experiment. You take these aggregates, put them uh, um, on top of uh, uh, in the media where they are, and then uh, I think we, uh, like you use uh, 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 we use a four hundred five nanometer laser. Um, I do not remember the power exactly, but it's just enough to like kill a cell. So it's the same laser that you would use in a wound healing experiment, and uh, we just uh, we go to an equatorial plane of this aggregate. Um, focus our laser at an edge and ablate it. Uh, if that's the process that you're asking. But the general idea for doing all that was to be able to measure these surface flows, which can actually be converted to surface stresses, and from there to be able to back calculate the change in surface tension. And the, the whole idea uh, of this thing is that we were actually able to get the same behavior of surface tension as a function of size using this probe independent technique. Uh, just a quick thing for Amrish, like Amrish had this question about, do we see any uh, large scale cellular rearrangement? We don't. So what we have done is that we have actually tracked the motion of uh, uh, some of these cells, like as uh, these uh, aggregates uh, uh, move in one direction versus another. And we see that the cells tend to come back to their starting position within an accuracy of a few microns. So, and that's why we think this is an elastic phenomenon. So, so, but yeah, yeah, I will, uh, I'll just keep running so that I do not run out of time quickly. So, so the idea is that we were able to find this, uh, again, this, the same kind of size dependent surface tension behavior using a probe independent technique. And uh, 
computer. And and because uh, so and now we think that because once you turn off like the motor activity, um, this behavior is uh, very much like uh, uh, starts behaving like a liquid. Uh, we wanted to measure the uh, response of uh, motor and actin, like the, the the material that actually makes the actin cortex in the network and is responsible for surface tension in cells. Uh, like what is happening to them in these aggregates? So we labeled actin and myosin, and when we do uh, like a chymograph or we, when we do like a cross-sectional profile to look at their distribution, we find that, uh, so in green, you're looking at actin concentration and you find that it is kind of constant throughout the size of the aggregate, uh, the same amount of actin in the bulk as on the surface. But what you find is that the myosin concentration is, myosin is kind of localized at the edges. When you go to an aggregate which is slightly larger, you see that this uh, behavior of like the amount of myosin which is localized at the edges goes down, so you have fewer myosin. And and if we integrate like the myosin intensity at the periphery, you find that it also has the same kind of one by R dependence, where you see that the myosin concentration is larger for smaller aggregates and smaller for large aggregates. And and that is what we think is what is guiding this behavior. Uh, if myosin is the force generating element and surface tension is force per unit length, you have more myosin in smaller aggregates, uh, which leads to this uh, effectively large surface tension, which decays over time uh, with, with the size of these aggregates uh, as uh, the total amount of myosin on the surface decreases. Now, now this could have been like a decent paper itself, uh, but at this point we decided that maybe we can go a step further and measure something else out of it. And, and that's when we come to the pressure measurement part of this thing. Now, the general idea is that if we can consider these aggregates as a liquid droplet with a surface tension gamma and size R0, uh, according to Laplace's law, we can associate a pressure with these things, which is the Laplace pressure, uh, which is the same pressure that allows you to, uh, it depends upon the uh, inversely to the size of the aggregate, uh, so the size of a droplet. And that's why blowing a balloon when it's small is harder when it's bigger. But when we do it for uh, the aggregate, we find that this has a response which looks slightly different than a regular fluid. We find that pressure scales as one by V to the power 0 0.6 or one by R to the power 1.8. Uh, if it was, uh, uh, so I mean, pressure scales as one by R square. If it was a regular fluid, it should have scaled as one by R. Um, we decided to do one more measurement. Uh, we wanted to see how many cells actually make this aggregate. So what we did is that if we take these aggregates and put them on a substrate, they will start spreading. And simply by running a PIV, or sorry, a particle tracking algorithm on these things, we can calculate how many cells make these aggregates. And uh, from there, we can actually calculate uh, the, cell, uh, the, the density of uh, particles which make these aggregates. Uh, Jose, raise the hand. Yes, Jose. I was just wondering, in this, um aggregate, are you not taking into consideration cell division? So, yeah, so all these uh, measurements, we are talking about uh, all these measurements which are happening at a time scale, which are much smaller than cell division, time scale. I see. So okay. we are not, uh, yeah, so all the, the experiments were, the ablation experiments were of the order of seconds, the uh, micropipette experiments, the longest one were of the order of an hour. And so, so yeah, we are not accounting for uh, um, the cell division part. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And so finally, what we observed is that uh, the thing that got our minds tingling is that if pressure scales as something close to one upon R square, like one upon R to the power 1.8, and density scales as something similar, um, exactly for this solid blue parts, uh, which is uh, where we actually counted each individual cell using particle tracking, that part scales exactly as 1.8 we realize that we can combine them in a certain way uh, that which makes which will make that combination independent of the size. And, and that is what we are going to call our equation of state, which is if you take the pressure of these aggregate, you multiply it by its volume divided by total number of cells, you get something which is independent of the size of this thing, uh, size of the aggregate. And so we would like to say that PV by N is equal to some kind of constant uh, where there is an effective temperature, which comes from the activity, is the equation of state for a tissue. Uh, 
um, if we uh, we can repeat these experiments for uh, uh, that is just like a reporting of the data um, that I've shown earlier in terms of pressure and density for the idea that from this slope, you can define an effective temperature. And we show that when you turn the motor activity off, uh, the slope goes down, showing that uh, the effective temperature of the aggregate has gone down as well. So finally, what makes us uh, happy or sad or upset or like really agitated is that this equation of state that we have calculated kind of looks familiar, which is the disturbing part because it looks familiar to something which is we know from, high, from college physics as an equation of state of an ideal gas. Now this law is derived for something where there is no interaction between particles, everything can move across each other. And then we calculate pressure and volumes for an aggregate, which is composed of cells, which are only interacting locally and uh, like, they mean uh, and strongly with each other, and we are still able to, at least in mathematical uh, form, like get an equation that looks very similar. So, to make an experimental sense of this, that what is happening, we think that because uh, pressure time volumes define some kind of an energetic potential, and n is the total number of cells, uh, the quantity PV by n is the energetic cost of adding a cell to a tissue. And uh, the way we verified it is by doing an experiment where we had cells onto a surface where the cells were sticking. And by using traction force microscopy, we can actually calculate the amount of work that is required to pull a cell from a substrate and add it to the aggregate. And we find that from, from that behavior that the total energy of this aggregate also scales with its size uh, linearly with the number of cells. And, and that's what we think is the, the reason that uh, this equation has this kind of behavior because all this is saying is that uh, the energetic principle that guides the growth of a tissue is that the tissue is trying to keep the cost of adding a cell fixed. And so, so in summary, uh, what I would like to say, if you forget everything from this talk, uh, remember that we measured the surface tension, we find that these surface tensions are size dependent and uh, if you turn off the activity, they are gone. And this size dependent surface tension gives rise to an equation of state that looks very much like an ideal gas equation. So, so, so where are we with respect to the big questions that we started? Um, the, one of the question is that, are there any guiding principle? We think, yes, there would be one, that the, the cells are trying to keep the energetic cost of growth fixed. Uh, is there an equation of state? Yes. Final question, is it sufficiently general? Uh, maybe not. Uh, maybe it's dependent upon size, up to a certain limit, on tissue type. But then what is the big deal, like if it is not general? Uh, I think the big deal is not that we have shown that there, uh, that you can combine these variables um, in, in a way to create an equation of state. I think the bigger deal is that we have shown that it's not impossible to do so. Uh, if you can do it for one system, maybe there's hope for others. Uh, if I go into full conjecture mode, uh, I would like to, maybe this could be a question for our theorist friends, friends is that, uh, uh, is it always possible to combine, if we can find pair of variables which uh, scale in a certain way with the size or, uh, of a, or a certain control parameter in a biological system, is it always possible to define an equation of state by combining them? So is it a more general principle than what we show here? So, so, so that was my two cents. I would like to thank you all for listening. We have time for more questions. Uh, if you would like to talk more, you can email me, uh, first name, last name at yale.edu, uh, or you can look at research at what our lab does at Living Matter or at my website at profit.com. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, thank uh, you. Thank you so much, Vikrant. So before questions, we will clap for you. Uh, for okay. your, thank you. Uh, so, so we do have time, <clears throat> uh, five minutes for questions, and then we will transition to the unrecorded version of this where we can have more informal discussion. Sure, so sure. if you have questions, please raise your hand and speak up. Abhinendra, I see a question from you in the chat. Do you want to yeah, just- Yeah, so Abhinendra is asking, uh, yeah. can the surface tension dependence be coming from the finite size effect? Is it possible to do a larger system size? Uh, it is experimentally more challenging. So. 
so the limits of these uh, it's it's not really difficult for uh, the uh, I, so I mean so the, it's not really difficult for the the surface tension part. We can create like aggregate of any size and uh, do like a measurement on on it. Uh, calculate the surface tension. The difficult part, which limits the experiment, is this part. Well, we have to calculate the number of cells which make it. Uh, we we can do like a Z stack, but at right now we are limited to about like 200 microns. Um, so we cannot look at the full aggregate. And uh, as the aggregate goes like bigger, uh, this spreading experiments do not usually work because uh, these things are going to take so long that uh, the questions that others were asking that the cell will start to divide and cell proliferation will come into effect. And uh, so, yeah, if there is a good technique for measuring these uh, aggregate size, uh, like number of cells, yeah, we'd be happy to do it. Thank you. Cooper asks, a graph that I would like to see the shape of one of the energy per cell in an aggregate versus one by R. Okay, I can plot it. <laughs> uh, energy per cell in an aggregate versus one by R. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I we we haven't done it. I I don't know what it would look like, but uh, uh, yeah, that, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, I'll I'll note it down. Uh, thanks, Abhinav. <clears throat> yeah. So there's time for more questions. So while people are thinking of, I mean, I the last part was a little too fast for me. So if I just to understand okay, sure, how sure. you got the equation of state, so. Uh, volume is just the size of the aggregate and pressure. How did you get pressure? It's a separate measurement or? So, so pressure is, uh, so we oh, have the Laplace surface tension measurement okay. sorry, sorry. from Laplace, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so we have like independent measurements of gamma, you have independent measurements of R0, and then you just put them together to get an effective pressure. And then you and just uh, see that something like Boyle's law happens, like P dot yeah, D seems yeah. to be a constant, okay. Yeah, so we find that pressure and density, like the number density of these aggregate uh, cells in the aggregate scales exactly, uh, or like to an experimental limit, like X scales the same way as the pressure. And uh, when you, we can combine these together in a way that this quantity is independent of the size. Okay, yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh, so the, what I was wondering about is like, as, as a, uh, if I were trying to model this, I would think of, like myosin motors activity is some kind of active stress or active pressure that they're generating and then creating some kind of fluid flow on this outer, uh, well, I don't know if the fluid flow is important for the surface tension measurement, but yeah, I mean, you, you the way you do the measurement by like just sucking out this, uh, the asp micro pipette aspiration, I mean, that gives us like a coarse grain lumped surface tension parameter, but yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of modeling it, if somebody, I, I think the right model would be to think of some kind of active liquid droplet with myosin creating a pressure, like an active pressure, right? Is that right? Uh, uh, yeah, I think so. I, I mean, uh, so so we have tried uh, doing like these, like multi-physics models uh, where we actually feed them the motor activity on the surface, uh, something as a two fluid model where the fluid on the top has like some kind of activity, whereas the fluid in the center is the the more passive component. And uh, and and from there we could recreate some of these behaviors. But yeah, so I mean that would be one way to go about it. And would that explain why there is this? Oh well, so the reason that there is a size dependence is that the myosin is localized on the surface. Yeah, or yeah. So so the thing is that like right now what we do is that we are feeding this idea to like the myosin uh, what we think is the is the more uh, organic way of this is happening is that uh, uh, as this aggregate grows like the curvature of the aggregate is changing and so when a cell lands onto the surface of this aggregate uh, it needs to stretch to a different extent and uh, we know that when cells are stretched differently like the cells which are more stretched they tend to employ more uh, phosphorylated myosin which is the active myosin and uh, and that's why we think that there is a relation between curvature and uh, uh, employment of myosin, and that is what is leading to this size-dependent surface tension. So so I think that is a more like a particle-based approach, um, and uh, uh, compared to like a more coarse-grain approach, uh, where yeah, where we 
assume that there is some kind of like to overall active fluid behavior. Okay, thank you. I think uh, are there, yeah, I, I think there are more questions. There are so. a few more questions, yeah. Okay. Uh, can, 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 can you, yeah, Evgeny, do you want can, to ask? Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, just a few cl clarifying questions. First yes. of all, the, the density is a function of spheroid size. How do you explain that the density changes? What, what, what really happens with the cell if you compare a smaller spheroid and a larger spheroid? Why would the density change? So, so, so what? Uh, uh, I mean, it, this would be sound more like like a chicken or egg problem. Uh, but then, because uh, essentially we are talking about like this, uh, like Laplace pressure, which is essentially like a pressure jump from uh, environment to the inside uh, of the segregate. So what we think is uh, happening is that because of like the larger surface tension, uh, the that's what is happening is that uh, the aggregate is getting more compressed. And uh, we have tried to measure the volume change of an indi uh, in individual cells. And uh, we have seen like uh, the volume by like at least like a factor of three changing from uh, the smallest aggregate to like the largest aggregate that we have looked at. So, so the so cells are in the center are essentially getting more and more compressed. They, they look smaller, they have smaller volume. Yes, uh, okay, this is a very, very good answer. Uh, uh, but the follow-up question is, uh, it can be related not to the Laplace pressure, but just to the fact that when you form the aggregates, I mean, I understand that your experiments are very fast, so, so there is no time for division, but the process of formation of an aggregate is slow. Therefore, when you form, say, a big aggregate, cells inside have time to divide and due to a lot of a lack of space they can be compressed so yes compared to to a small aggregate i mean if you just put cells on a substrate and wait you will yeah, see no. that uh, in the center cells are smaller and outside cells are larger and and this is not related to laplace pressure this is related just to the fact that you know, there is higher that a cell inside it wants to grow, yes, after division, but it cannot because there are there are cells around. I see. So, I mean, so so one of the questions, like so, so I'll just go to a slight tangent here because one of the questions that we got from like the reviewers, which was uh, uh, like which always came back, was that uh, would there be a difference between aggregates where uh, all the cells were like brought together at once and allowed to relax, or where if you had uh, an aggregate with a few cells that organically grew to a bigger, like with the surface tension behave in the same way. And uh, in in our mind, I think we we argued that uh, that yeah, uh, an aggregate would not know like how it was formed, and uh, so maybe the aggregates where the cells were brought together or uh, the cell where the aggregates where the cell grew would behave similarly. But I, I don't think I have a like a good answer to like that particular question. Okay, so, in, in yeah, I, I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. In other quick, quick, small questions, do cells move? Or I, I, I missed that point. Or, or cells are, are not moving inside the the aggregate. So, so, so over the like the time scale where, where we are doing experiments, they do not. They do not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or I mean, even if they are moving, they are like very small. Like the the deformation is smaller than the size of the aggregate. So, mm -hmm. as I said, like the most of the motion is kind of reversible. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, so Richard Gordon asks, what happens in limit of one cell? Uh, so, I, th I think Frank Dulisher has this beautiful paper where they measure like surface tension of like single cells, and uh, and the pressures that they get and are kind of like comparable. The surface tensions that they get, I think are a bit smaller of the order of one to two millinewtons per meter. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know what happened. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think we know that if you have a smaller cell versus a bigger cell, what will happen to its surface tension. Uh, or what we know that is that when the cells are stressed uh, or when they are stretched, uh, they will they will employ more myosin and they will it will make it stiffer. 